How's everyone doing? Good, good. I am so excited to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more year into the 4-0. So I'm going to live it up. I'm going to live it up. Live while we're young. Huh? Uh, well, so there's a, another... Everyone who's past 40 is like, bruh. <laughs> Come over to our side. Come over to our side. So another, another day that was uh, really, really uh, good for me just last couple weeks on July 16th, Amy and I celebrated 17 years Woo! married. Yeah. Amen. So good. And man, you know what? Uh, Amy is just so easy to love. That's what I love about her. She is um, amazing. Amazing. I love you. You're amazing. Um, she is my cradle of security and moments of vulnerability. Um, she like literally when I met her, the trajectory of my life changed. Like that's how impactful uh, her presence has been in my life. Um, and so, you know, we have just been reflecting on our journey and uh, as amazing as our story is, our sacred history is, um, there, there was some difficulty, okay? That, that we almost didn't make it, okay, a couple of times. Uh, so I, I've shared some of that stuff with you guys, but, but one in particular, I want to share two of them with you. Uh, one thing that made it difficult to be in a relationship with Amy is that she and I went to rival high schools. <laughs> okay, so she went to Real Linda High School I went to Center High School. I mean, this is like in, this is around here, okay? And not so much anymore. I think the divisions have changed and all that, so I don't think it's the same. But like when we were in high school, bitterest of rivals. Every single time we had a basketball game or a football game, there was always some racial dynamic that was at play. You know, you could never walk, like when, when our games would end, like we would all get together and, you know, have our heads on a swivel. Like it was just dangerous to be on their campus and vice versa and craziness. Um, I was a varsity basketball player. Amy was a cheerleader, right? So this is like, this is like a modern day Bromeo and Juliet, okay? <laughs> like, just like, like, like we still to this day have friends that don't approve of us being together because I was a center high cougar and she was a real end of night. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's for real. Matter of fact, uh, her brother, Justin, who some of you guys know, uh, when I was starting to get to know him, um, I would go over to their house and I would, I would hang out and we'd be playing video games or whatever. And he had a bathroom attached to his, his room. And so I would go into his bathroom and the first time I went to his bathroom, I went in there and I lifted up the toilet seat to go and he had a center high school cougar sticker <laughs> for me to aim at. I was like, bro, I'm not using your bathroom. Like, like the beef was real, okay? The beef was real. It was real. Um, another difficulty uh, that we had to fight through was our color difference. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people would like to think that issues of race, you know, came and went in the, in the 60s and the 70s, which is not a thing. Uh, matter of fact, I would say that the American church still is grappling with issues of race, really trying to figure it out. Um, and the church that I got saved in, and let me just tell you, this uh, church is an amazing church filled with amazing, precious saints. Uh, but they had a really hard time with this black guy walking into their church and dating the darling of their church. I mean, Amy, I told you guys, Amy was almost born in her church. And so here I come into the church and I'm dating her. Um, and and I, I found it very, very hard to feel accepted in that place. But then two things happened. Two, two people happened, okay? Uh, the first person was Amy's grandpa, Charles, all right? Now, uh, whenever I would go uh, into church, there was always just tension, you know? Like, you ever been in a place where you know everyone's looking at you, Right? And so I just like, it was just weird all the time. And then one day Amy invited me over and like the whole, you know, her whole family went to this church. I mean, it was, you know, a family affair here. So I'm walking in, disturbing everything. She invites me to a family uh, celebration. I think it was, it was Christmas. Okay. So she invited me over for Christmas and I was dreading going. 
Like, I, like for me, I was like, I just don't know how many more like events I can go to and feel to, like an outsider. And so I was dreading it, dreading it, dreading it. And, uh, and so I show up. Now, what I didn't know is that her grandpa, Charles, um, you know, he was a crafty gentleman and he loved specific holidays. He really, really liked Halloween and he really liked Christmas and he would decorate the outside of their house. And so what he did on this day is he decorated outside of their house and he carved out three shepherds and he put three shepherds on the lawn. But one of the three shepherds, he intentionally painted black. And so when I walked up to the house, I got there and I walked up, I was shocked to see a black shepherd just posted. <laughs> and what was so shocking to me as I walked in, I said, I thought to myself, it's like, oh, not only am I seeing this, everyone as they walk into the door is seeing this. And so what was understood didn't need to be said, but what he was communicating to the family was, we're doing this. I don't care what you think or how you feel, but he is welcome here. And he set a tone for the whole family. Amen. We'll take that. Amen. Listen, he set a tone for the whole family that day. And from then on, I never had issues of not feeling accepted by the family. Uh, the second person is Amy's great grandmother, Grandma Meyer. All right. Now she, when I, when I came into the scene, she was uh, elderly. Um, she was a, a woman of very few words, but she just had this ministry of presence about her, you know, and, uh, you know, born in the early 1900s, laid to rest in the early 2000s. She had lived through, you know, the, the tumultuous racial history of America, as did Grandpa Charles. Um, but on our wedding day, on her great granddaughter's wedding day, I don't remember how it happened, but I was walking with her. It was just me and her and we were walking. She had a walker, but I was kind of helping her, you know, with her strides. And she stops in the middle, like, I think we were on the dance floor. She stops in the middle of the wedding in front of everyone. And she grabs my hand and she kisses it. <sighs> and what was understood didn't need to be said. But from the oldest remaining member of Amy's family, I was received and welcomed. Uh, and there's many stories like this. I know, you know, there's stories that Amy can tell as well um, of times where my family has brought her in. But just as we were reflecting and considering our 17 year history, man, we, we are, Amy and I are our ancestors' wildest dreams. <laughs> like for real wildest dreams. Um, and, you know, it, it just meant so much to me and it, and it really brought me in. But the reason why we're our ancestors' wildest dreams is because we have family who initiated, initiated welcome to the other. See, um, a carved out black shepherd, a kiss on the hand, you know, the reason why these things are so impactful is because a life poured out in deeds of mercy for those in need is an undeniable sign of true faith. Amen. 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 And so uh, we are finishing a short series that we've been calling the greatest. And the intent has been to look at biblical hospitality and to show from the scriptures that the rescuing love and welcome of God was not only at the center of what Jesus came to do, um, but as we've been talking about invitation today, okay, invitation, this is also what God is calling us as a family of God to do. Amen. And so last time I spoke, we looked at the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors as yourself. And we camped uh, in the story of the, of the good Samaritan. And we learned together that Jesus Christ is the great Samaritan to whom the good Samaritan points. You guys remember that? Today, I want to look at one of the last events of Jesus's life. Right, his last night with his disciples, right? From this place, he will go to the Mount of Olives and there he will be captured. Uh, there he will be unfairly put on trial. He'll be beaten and hung on a cross, all right? And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 13. We're gonna look at this passage here. And, you know, just consider this with me. You know, if, if this, is, 
This is Jesus' last night, all right, on the earth. Then surely what happens here will mean something, yeah? This is last night, it'll mean something. All right, so John chapter 13, we're gonna start in verse one. It says, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth and now he had loved them to the very end. It was time for supper and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the father had given him his ro- uh, had given him authority, excuse me, and everything uh, and and that had he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands, my head uh, as well, Lord, not just my feet. And Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you uh, understand what I'm doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Okay. So from this story, I want to show you four things. Okay. From the story, I want to show you uh, that Jesus was selfless enough to wash feet. That Jesus was secure enough to wash feet. That Jesus was sympathetic enough to wash feet. And then we'll finish with the fact that Jesus was a standard so that his disciples will one day wash feet. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time in your presence, this sweet time, Lord, just from the worship set, just seeing my sister battle, not feeling good all week, and then be able to show up today and rock the house. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you that you are here. I thank you, God, for the invitation that you give us not to be your employees, not to be your slaves, Lord, to be your children. And so, God, as we look at this story and as we consider the fact that you, as Savior of the world, will get on your knees and wash feet, Lord, help us to capture what you were doing in that moment. I heard a song uh, just this morning that said, Um, you know, that you don't give yourself in pieces and that you don't hide yourself to tease us. And so we just ask God that you would just be with us today. Would you meet us here in Jesus name? And everyone said, amen. 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 Okay. You guys ready to get on the ride with me? All right. I gave you the table of contents. You know how long you're riding with me. Okay. So number one, Jesus was selfless enough to wash feet. All right. Now, the first verse says that Jesus' hour had come. Now, anytime in the Gospels you uh, see it talking about Jesus' hour, it's always talking about his death. All right. It's always talking about that. So his hour had come to leave the earth and to return to the Father. He was hours away from being brutally murdered. Yet, in this moment, he's thinking about his disciples. And so Jesus wasn't just selfless, but he was operating from a spiritual principle of self-forgetfulness. All right, now self-forgetfulness defined is the ability to put the interests and good of others before one's own immediate gratifications and wants. Okay, uh, a group of psychologists said this about it. They said, developing self-forgetfulness leads toward discovery of the individual self through connecting with and for others that we become our more fulfilled and engaged selves by developing that aspect of the self that is of and for others. 
Okay, translation, right? The image of God that is in us has always made us in such a way that we are for others, that there's something about pouring our lives out for others that is fulfilling to us, right? That, that, that Paul in Philippians chapter two, right? Thousands of years ago, when he said in humility of mind, right? Consider others as more important than yourself, okay? It, it, as it turns out, the Bible was right thousands of years ago and the smartest people on the earth now are telling us what we've always known, all right? And so when we're hurting, our culture prescribes self-care, does it not? That's what it prescribes, self-care, right? But in Jesus's upside down kingdom, when you're hurting, there's something about selflessness. There's something about serving others that is life-giving, right? The Bible says that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, that we were his reward, that somehow thinking of us while he's hanging on the cross made the cross more bearable. That's what it's saying, right? And so there's nothing more psychologically disintegrating than self-absorption. Right? There, there's nothing more socially destructive than self-centeredness. And so I, I want you to think about what's stressing you out right now. Okay, think about your hardship for a second, all right? Because if you can be selfless enough under stress to bless others, it'll literally drain the power out of your hardship. There's something about that, right? And so the, the, the selflessness of the, the early Christians in the Greco-Roman empire was so evident and overwhelming that it lended tremendous credibility to the apostles teaching. Um, and it didn't just end there in the lives of the apostles because about a century later, there was this new emperor who came around. His name was Julian. And uh, in Julian, when he came to power, one of the things about him, and he's actually, I think there's like a name for him. He hated Christians so much. He's like historically known like for hating Christians so much. Uh, and he was so upset with the growth of Christianity that he put a ton of money and a ton of energy and a ton of resources into uh, renovating the pagan religion and, and temples. Um, and, and with all that work that he was doing, it didn't work. He had a really hard time, it didn't work. And at one point he wrote a letter to one of his friends who was a pagan priest, right? And we actually, we still have this letter, but he wrote this letter and in this letter, he was telling him why he thought Christianity was spreading as much as it was, okay? And this is what he said, listen to this. He says, nothing has contributed to the progress of the superstition of these Christians as their charity to strangers. The impious Galileans provide not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. Okay, can I translate that for you? What he's saying is the Romans take care of the Roman poor, the Jewish take care of the Jewish poor, the Greek take care of the Greek poor. But the problem with these Christians is that they are so promiscuous with their generosity. Amen. No matter how hard we make it for them to dwell among us, they still see people among them and they think of them before themselves. And Julian says, this is what gives them so much credibility. This is what gives them credibility, right? They literally care about everyone. Now, now, now think about this for a second, okay? This is a hostile pagan God hater, <laughs> right? This is a man who's looking for anything he can to discredit the Christian church. And, 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 and even he has to sit back and say, man, that's, that's really, that's admirable about them. Even he has to say that. And so here's my question for us. My question for us is the people that you know who hate Christians, do they say, you know what? I hate this and I hate this and I hate this, but, but you know what? They are really good at this. That, that they really serve the poor well. I, I mean, they pour their lives out for the vulnerable. Do they say that? Do you know that the Christian church is one of the very few institutions that exists for the benefit of its non-members? Is that who we are? No? Why not? Good. 
I'll, I'll tell you why. Out of the mic still, right? Check, check. Okay. The reason why is because washing feet requires a selflessness and a self-forgetfulness. And maybe, just maybe, we have a lot less of it than we think. Can I go to a point two? Would that be okay? All right. So Jesus was selfless enough to wash feet. But second, Jesus was secure enough to wash feet. John 13, starting in verse three, Jesus knew that the father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and will return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel he had around him. Now, every single culture has deep background beliefs that are so taken for granted that they're actually invisible to us as beliefs. Okay. We believe in our culture that greatness means that other people need to serve us. That's what we think. Now, the disciples believe the same thing, right? But in one action, in one moment, Jesus completely shatters this belief system. Right? Because being completely secure in who he was, he exchanged his rank for a rag. He, he exchanged his prominence for a pot of water. He exchanged his crown for an apron. And he gets on his knees and he begins to wash their nasty feet. Don't, don't let that be lost on you how nasty this was. Jesus, in a culture that said, the lowest ranking person in the house needs to do this. The greatest person in the house did it. And so some of us, let me just say this. Some of us, man, you go to work every day and cool, you're the boss, we get it. You got the title, we understand. But do you serve your employees you want to rock the world? You go, go in and do some of the stuff that they know they should do. They'll be talking about you and it won't be the bad way. Like, like we, we, we know, you know, one thing that my mom always said to me when I was doing chores and complaining about doing chores, don't hold this against her because she's amazing. But one thing she would always say, she would always say, hey, man, I gave birth to you so you can do this stuff, Okay. <laughs> Right, but, but mate, you're a parent at home. Like, do your kids ever see you like do anything? Like we get it. You bring in the money, your house, you buy the food, we get it all. But do you ever do anything? Let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> see who you believe you are says everything about what you're willing to do, right? And some of us could never serve others. We could never wash certain people's feet because we so desperately need for them to see us a certain way to make ourselves feel good. We so need that. But Jesus proves that with proper identity, if you have the smile of God on you, all other frowns are inconsequential. You understand that? Uh, there was... Um, a rancher in West Texas uh, during the depression by the name of Ira Yates, right? Uh, and Mr. Yates was like many other ranchers and farmers during that time. He had a lot of land and a lot of debt and unable to make enough on his ranching operation to pay the principal and interest on the mortgage. He was in danger of losing his ranch. And so with little money for clothes and food, his family had to live on government subsidy. One day, an oil company came to the area and they told him that they believed that there may be oil on his land. They asked permission to, dwell, uh, to, to drill a, a well and he obliged. And upon digging, they struck a huge oil reserve. Eventually, they discovered that he had enough oil to fill tens of thousands of barrows per day. 
All right, and Mr. Yates owned it all. See, when he, when he purchased his property, uh, he also received all the oil and mineral rights, yet he had been living on relief. A billionaire living in poverty. The problem, he didn't know that the oil was there even though he owned it. I think many of us are like Mr. Yates. See, as Christians, we are heirs of a vast treasure, yet many of us live in spiritual poverty. We, we see needs around us and we're so quick to hoard our resources and fear that will run out when the truth of the matter is that we are spiritual billionaires. This is who we are. Spiritual billionaires. Man, I, I wonder what would happen. I wonder what would happen if the church began living like we've truly been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. I, I wonder what would happen if we as a church would stand up and really see ourselves as ambassadors for Christ on the earth. I, I wonder what would happen if I really finally began to see myself as a prince of the kingdom of heaven and start to live like it. Listen, I, I do not want to live like I'm poor if I'm not. I do not want to hoard all my resources because of a faulty view of who I really am. How about you? And so Jesus was selfless enough to wash feet. And because of his identity, because he knew who he was, he was secure enough to wash feet. Amen? So got number three. Number three, Jesus was sympathetic enough to wash feet. He was sympathetic enough to wash feet. You know, there are two disciples that are central focuses of this passage, right? You have Judas and you have Peter. And all throughout the whole story, John goes to great lengths. If you read the whole passage, John is like trying to like drill it in our heads that Judas, his betrayer is in the room, right? And that Jesus washes Judas's feet like he washes everyone else's feet. Right? And, and, and what we know, because we read the whole story, is that Judas would leave this event and he would betray Jesus. Right? He would sell him out to those who wanted to arrest and kill him. And yet, Jesus still did this. Right? And so, we can learn something. We can learn something from Judas. Right? This is what we can learn. We can learn that Judas, Judas had the best small group experience of all time. <laughs> Judas sat under the, the best preaching of all time. And the Bible says that Jesus, as he went, he would preach and do good. Yeah. So not only did Judas have a great small group experience, and not only did he have the best pastor in the world, but Judas saw so many signs and wonders and miracles worked in his presence. He saw it all. And there's more because Judas was also part of the group that Jesus sent out to teach and to preach and to minister. You know what that means? Is that even Judas was doing signs and wonders and miracles. He had the best experience. Judas knew theology. Judas knew church attendance. Right? Judas probably had massive amounts of people coming up to him saying, man, you changed my life. You changed my life. You changed my life. I, I would even venture to say he had more people than all of us in this room who came to him saying, man, because of you, I'm never the same. And yet, of all the transformation that he was a part of, the transformation never made it in him. He never experienced inner transformation. And so here's what I want to say to you, is that it is very possible to jerry-rig your behavior, to make yourself look like you have the character of Jesus. But there is really no change in your character at all. Are you clapping for you or other people? I need, this is what I need to know. 
you can look like a child of God. You can act like a child of God. You can talk like a child of God. Other children of God can look at you and think you're a child of God. You can even experience some of the benefits that other children of God are experiencing and still not be one. Jesus knew this and he still washed his feet. And what Jesus was communicating was, same thing he's communicating to us, by the way. You've been with me for all this time. You've even benefited from being around me. But here is yet another personal invitation into relationship. And if you take this invitation, let me tell you what's gonna happen. If you take this invitation, it will completely change you on the inside. It'll change all your, your, your heart motivations. This is what it'll do, Judas. It'll change everything. Serving people won't drain you, it'll fulfill you. Loving people won't be transactional. Right, it, it, it'll, it'll produce joy in you. And so that's Judas, but then there's Peter. All right, if I didn't get you on Judas, saddle up. <laughs> when Jesus went to wash Peter's feet, he declined. You will never wash my feet. All right. Jesus' response should convict all of us because he said, Peter, if, if you don't let me serve you, Man, if you don't let me serve you, you won't belong to me. We can't be one. That's what he says. So I think, I think we love the idea of calling each other brother and sister and family. But many of us resent the very things that create family bonds. And the reason why I know that is, you know, when we get into conflict with each other, what do we do? We run. When we see someone who has needs, we turn our heads when we ourselves are in need, we suffer in silence. We don't speak up. See, some of us would never get on our knees and wash others' feet, but others are like Peter. You will never wash my feet. And right here, this, this pride on both sides, okay? There's a pride that says, I won't help anyone. There's also a pride that says, I won't let anyone help me. And this pride on both sides is what keeps us in this superficial doom loop of, of, of fake family. This is what's keeping us there. And it's not fooling anybody, by the way. The outside world looks at it and they can see when we're not aligned. They can see it. The Bible says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, All right? See, there's a reciprocity in that statement, All right? That means that there are times when you're gonna have to come alongside someone and you're gonna have to take off some of the load as you walk with them. But there's other times when you're gonna have to let someone come alongside you and shoulder your load as well. Like, like do you know? Do you know that it can actually serve your pride to serve others? That some of us serve other people and, and we mean well, but we're really actually serving ourselves when we're doing it. Like you can actually feed your own pride by serving others. But here's the reality. Some of us will never understand the gospel of grace. We will never understand how poor we are spiritually until we allow a brother or sister in the faith serve us. And it's hard. It's hard. I know. But let me be clear. Let me, let me make sure I tell you guys what I'm saying right here. Some of us don't do anything for anyone. Quiet. Some of us don't do anything for anyone. 
And so throwing yourself faithfully, and the key word is faithfully, throwing yourself faithfully into serving other people, that's what's gonna actually drain you of pride, right? But then there's some of you who would rather take a street food tour through Wuhan (laughs) than allow someone else to serve you. But that very thing would drain you of pride. That's what would drain you. Unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. That's what Jesus says. You know, how, how, can, we, how can we ever have deep relationship that transcends our color differences? Can, can I just tell you guys, I go to a predominantly white church on purpose. Like I didn't just step in and not notice this. I'm not colorblind. (laughs) How can we ever transcend the differences in color? How can we ever transcend the differences in our socioeconomic statuses? How can we ever transcend the differences in our political leanings if we don't commit to washing? Listen, I am dirty and I need you to wash me but you're dirty too. And you need me to wash you. We need that. And so through selflessness and self-forgetfulness and patience and sympathy, as Jesus shows us by washing feet, that's when we truly become one. That's when we become one. And so Jesus was selfless enough to wash feet. Jesus was secure enough to wash feet. Jesus was sympathetic enough to wash feet. And lastly, number four, Jesus was the standard so that his disciples would one day wash feet. See, in his selflessness, in his security, um, in his sympathy, Jesus was trying to set a standard for his disciples. He was trying to make them like him. Right? I have given you an example to follow, he said to them. Do as I have done. And in a few short hours, he would show them the ultimate example of love and service to others. Amen. Let's stand together. I want to I want to finish with this last story. Um, and it comes out of Matthew chapter 25. And if you've heard me preach before, you've heard me reference this. And the reason why I reference this so much is because this, this convicts me so bad. And if it convicts me, I just want to share the wealth. Okay. But in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talks about judgment day. And in his description, he compares it to the common task of shepherds whose jobs it is to identify and remove goats from a flock of sheep. Okay. Now, goats and sheep are very similar, but they are not the same. Right? And, and there are many breeds that are really hard to tell apart. But Jesus says that at the end of time, he will take everyone who looks the same and he will put the sheep at his right hand and he'll put the goats at his left hand. And to the sheep, he will say, enter into my kingdom. But to the goats, he'll say, depart from me. Now, what's the difference between the sheep and goats? Thanks for asking. Let me tell you. (laughs) To the sheep, he will say, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you came and you visited me. And the righteous in that moment, they'll say, man, that's really flattering. Jesus, thank you. But can, can you remind me again when I did that? And they'll say, oh yeah, yeah, When you served your neighbor, you were serving me. Then to the goats, he'll say, you know, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me a drink. When I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. When I was naked, you didn't give me any clothes. 
When I was sick, you didn't take care of me. And when I was in prison, you didn't come see me. And they're going to say, wait, 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 wait. I would have did this for you. What, what, when did that happen? He said, oh yeah, by the way, when you ignored your neighbor, you ignored me. I know we've all heard the story many different ways and many times over the years of the, the elderly lady who um, was dying and she had a nephew that she was going to leave all her money to. But she wanted to know what type of guy her nephew really was. Because every time he would come over, he was always so nice, so kind, so pleasant. And so what did she do? She decided to dress up as a homeless woman and sit on his porch. And when he came out of his house, he was so mean to her and so cruel and he kicked her away. And she knew in that moment what type of man her nephew was. And this is what Jesus is communicating in Matthew chapter five, you guys. Because Jesus is saying, when you've done it for the least of these, you did it for me. He's saying, I really am the homeless person on your doorstep. Jesus is saying, the way that I know your heart and what you're really like is not how you act when you come into my house on Sundays. No, it's the way you act on the streets. Jesus is saying that. The way I know that is because, because I'm really there. I'm in disguise. I really am those people. I really am those people. And a life poured out in deeds of mercy for those in need. It is an undeniable sign of true faith. Amen. It is. I mean, don't you understand? That on judgment day, you and I cannot say to the Lord, when did we see you thirsty? When did we see you naked? When did we see you captive? Don't you know we can't say that? The reason why is because all of it happened on the cross. On the cross, Jesus was stripped naked. He was nailed and hung on it. And while he was lying there dying for you and me, he said, I thirst. On the cross, he did that. And so the cross is the ultimate picture of selflessness, security, sympathy, all of it hanging on a standard. And he did it all for us. Amen. Jesus washes feet and he washes sins away. And if you see him, pouring out his life for you. And if you allow it to, to serve you, not just in practical ways, but serving you for all of eternity. If you allow it to melt your heart and heal you where you're hurting and fix you where you're broken, it'll be the producer of so much joy in your life, guys. And not only will it produce joy, but it will not be a threat to your greatness. It'll actually be the undeniable sign of it. Amen. And so with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, man, if you're here today and you would say, Sean, something you said today hit me. That, that I need selflessness. I need self-forgetfulness to be operative in my life. Maybe you're saying, Sean, I'm not secure. I do not understand my identity as a child of God. Maybe you're here and that's the whole issue for you, that you're not a child of God and you come in and you, know, you smile at us every Sunday and we'll smile back, we love you. But you know this, you are not a child of God, but you want to be right here, right now. There's an invitation The Spirit of God is here right now, and He's inviting you. So with all heads bowed, all eyes closed, if you would say, Sean, I want to RSVP to this invitation, just raise your hand. We just want to pray for you. We just want to pray. I see you, sister. Anyone else? I see you. I see you. I see you. Four hands. Anyone else, guys? Oh, God. Anyone else? 
We've got four people in the room. We'll hold for, for another person. You hear and you would say, Sean, if I died today, I do not know if Jesus would see me as a sheep or a goat. If you say, I don't know the answer to that, but I wanna know, raise your hand. We just wanna pray for you, I see you. If you're here, you would say, Sean, I know I'm a child of God, but man, I need to be a washer of feet. I need to follow Jesus' example. Raise your hand, I wanna pray for you as well, guys. As believers, we have to course correct on this. We have to be known as people who don't just know the right answer to things, but we know a God who can heal all and fix all things, amen. And so Lord Jesus, all around the room, as people have responded, Lord, would you do in their hearts what they've asked? The Lord Jesus, you came from heaven to earth to die on a cross so that you could come near. And so for those who with sincerity in their heart are saying yes, are receiving this invitation, would you by your spirit begin to testify that they are children of God? God, we thank you for all you're doing in our presence. We thank you for what you're doing before us. In Jesus' name.